conversation impact the SBCC community of practice, which will be presented by Gail Burgess today. She is actually joining us from her Thailand office, um, so do bear with us if there's a very slight delay, but I think it should all be absolutely fine. So Gail is currently the Programme Officer at Traffic International and a lead in behavioural science for conservation impact. The SBCC Community of Practice is a panel of experts with a stake, passion, interest or mandate in changing wildlife product consumer choice, uh, brought together through the Wildlife Consumer Behaviour Change Toolkit, which is a project currently managed by Traffic. So during this webinar today, Gail will introduce some of the theoretical foundation underpinning this really innovative work as well as the activities being conducted in various parts of Asia and the impact um, they have had so far. So as always, there will be time for Q&A session after Gail's presentation. So please do submit your questions in the chat box in the bottom left hand screen, corner of the screen at the moment in the chat box down there, and I will ask them on your behalf at the end of the session. So thank you for your attention and please stand by because this webinar will be starting shortly. That's great. Thanks very much, Rihanna. And uh, hello, everybody. I was going to say good evening. It's evening where I am in Thailand, but uh, I'm sure you're spread uh, in, in various parts of the globe. So um, I hope you enjoy the session. Um, very much excited to be able to talk to you about this topic. It's uh, something very close to my heart. And uh, I've had a relationship with uh, IES. I've been a member since 2010. Um, and uh, yeah, really nice to be able to um, put something back into such a great organisation who've um, always done their best to champion kind of um, professional interest in, in this sector and many others besides. So um, big thank you and shout out to them. Um, happy to try to field any questions that might come through um, in the chat box in real time. Um, in particular, please let me know if I'm not speaking clearly enough or if you can't hear me very well. Um, but otherwise, I'll presume everything's fine and make sure that we try to leave enough time for any questions at the end of the session. Um, so I think that's uh, everything by way of introduction. Um, just give you a little bit of um, kind of background about uh, my relationship with IES. So as I say, I've been uh, a full member since 2010. I did my um, Chartered Environmentalist, um, a CM in a day, which uh, for those of you that might be considering doing that, it's really an excellent way to do that. Um, so strongly recommend that to you. I really enjoyed it and found it um, very quick and um, suitable for people that really have no time left in their lives, like most of us, I'm sure. Um, and um, yeah, it was also a great way to talk about my work and, and to figure out how um, you know the IES and I could um, kind of work together and, in a little more um, structured way in order to achieve some exciting outcomes. One of the um, early things that I did was um, provide some guest editorial services on this particular edition of Environmental Scientist. Um, we focused on extinction, um, which perhaps is a uh, less traditional topic or um, something that uh, isn't really sort of um, one of the common themes that in environmental scientists maybe focus on. But um, uh, my own background is, is very diverse. I've worked a lot in sustainable lifestyles. Um, I've also done work in health and development. Um, I guess my core specialism is, is behavioral science, social science. Um, and I look forward to talking to you about how that work is moving forward currently through um, the set of slides that I'm going to be delivering today. So um, do have a look at the journal. I'd love any feedback on it, even though it was published some time ago now. So to explain a little bit about um, traffic, uh, not sure how many of you have heard about traffic before. We're an international NGO um, focused on wildlife trade. Uh, in my next slide, I'll give you a little bit of a sense of, of kind of what we mean by that. Um, but just initially to explain, we're not a super huge um, kind of network. We have around 160 people. But we're very geographically dispersed. I am based in the UK headquarters. Um, I spent three years in East Asia um, living in, in Hong Kong um, until October last year. So um, I've, I've moved back now and um, I still travel quite frequently to the region. Um, I, I am in Thailand today. I was in China last week um, and I'll, I'll be sort of uh, coming back to Thailand and Vietnam um, in, in the next month. So um, just to reassure you all, I do do my best to offset my carbon 
um, and uh, but certainly the, the work is really exciting um, and certainly a lot of the application of behavioral science at the moment for conservation impact is um, is really quite urgent in the Asia region um, and I'll explain a little bit more about uh, why in, in the next few slides. Um, so traffic's program framework um, I'm sure the slides will be shared later so for those that are super interested um, do have a look um, at our vision and mission and our, our website we've got lots of great resources on there um, for, for those that are sort of generally interested in, in the latest research and evidence and insight into the volume of trade in different species, both um, flora as well as fauna, uh, huge proportions of uh, flora in trade, um, but they're often not the ones that feature in the headlines. Um, and, uh, you know, we've got a, a system systematic approach to, to identifying what the majority of, of species are in trade and um, also some great research reports on, on how that uh, impacts different regions. So uh, I guess the graphic on the left of this slide, the key thing to take away from it really would be this uh, colour scheme. So um, about 50% of our programme ambition is focused on enhancing the benefits from sustainable and legal trade. Um, and about the other half is, is focused on reducing um, illegal trade. So it's kind of um, an, a, an even split and, and some of the work kind of integrates both approaches in, in, uh, into one project um, where there are opportunities to tackle illegal trade, for example, by promoting sustainable trade in, in either that species or another one. Um, so, um, yeah, I'll go through a few more of the, the project examples in due course, but um, uh, do do have a look at traffic.org. Um, there's a, a lot of material available on there if you're interested in this issue. Um, another resource that I would really recommend to you is um, the UN Office on Drugs and Crime um, produced something called the World Wildlife Crime Report. Um, this uh, resolution of this particular graphic isn't great, so apologies for that, but mainly I wanted to give a sense of um, the breadth of species and taxa um, that are actually involved in um, this particular is obviously um, in relation to illegal trade, um, international illegal trade because it's about seizures um, and it's quite interesting to think often we hear about rhinos and elephants and tigers, um, you know emblematic species, very iconic, uh, very easy to sort of relate to their, their, their stories and their circumstances. We know a lot through nature documentaries about um, where they're found and, and kind of their habits and almost their lifestyle choices. Um, but often it's it's very, you know, a large volume of the trade, over a third is in is in rosewood, timber species. Um, and and so it's interesting to think about um, you know the the breadth of taxa that actually are involved in uh, illegal trade internationally. Um, I'm particularly interested in the use type. So the um, table one that you can see on the right hand side there starts to show how actually consumers are, are kind of thinking about these species. Often they're not really focused on the taxa or where they come from. They're, they're more focused on the uses um, and those spread from kind of recreational um, type uses through to medicinal. Um, we don't really put them on a spectrum, but it's interesting to think about this type of emotional use, which is about um, hedonic fulfillment, demonstration of status, sometimes quite functional purpose for household display like furniture or um, jewelry. Um, but then it goes through obviously to nutritional use, cosmetics and perfumes, these sorts of things, healthcare products, um, traditional medicine use in particular, huge variety of uses of, of taxa in trade. And um, sadly the reality is there are a, a large number of species and really um, very seriously threatened by um, illegal trade of, of this type. Um, so there's a, a good role for behavioural science in, in helping to tackle this. This particular theory of change illustrates that, or attempts to. Um, situational crime prevention model um, offers a, a way of thinking about how you tackle illegal trade of, of various commodities. This particular one on the screen is focused on, on wildlife commodities, obviously. Um, I guess the key thing to observe would be this um, balance of effort uh, across what we would call a trade route. So thinking um, in simple terms, if you think about it, a, a trade route between Africa and Asia, Africa being the source region and Asia being the, the consumption region in, in this particular example, 
um, uh, you know, effort um, in situ in Africa will be focused on stopping the poaching, so protecting animals in, in range states, trying to preserve populations, biodiversity, integrity in protected areas, trying to ensure that livelihoods and communities are benefiting from the wildlife and natural resources available in their, in their um, backyard. Um, trying to stop the trafficking along the trade route between that um, population or, or protected area um, through across to Asia where it's, it's focused on stop the buying. Um, and behavioral science at the moment is in particular being applied to stop the buying. Um, although you think uh, the law is, is probably, um, you know, it, it's a critical component of work to mitigate the markets for illegal products, um, actually, in our experience, it's also very important to issue messaging to shape motivation, what we would call the twin track approach to um, demand reduction, reducing the demand for illegal products, is, is a balance between um, societal level measures that actually restrict the availability of products in markets, um, alongside messaging to shape individual motivation. And so the work that I'm focused on is, is trying to help people make the right choices about which messaging to pick and why. Um, the, the other way to think about the, 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 the theory of change is this balance between increasing the effort criminals need to make in order to engage in legal trade, increase the indirect and direct risks for them to do that, and reduce the rewards. So the work to stop the buying using a behavioral science approach um, is about reducing the rewards there. There's more information on this type of theory of change on our website if you're interested. So, so what is this uh, social and behavioral change communication? So I've mentioned about behavioral science. Often at the moment, the language around this is, is very much characterized by um, social and behavioral change communications, SBCC. Um, it actually has origins in the health and development field. It's a, a, a process. This particular graphic picks up on some of the domains or the strategic areas in which SBCC is recognized as, as being applied. Um, but the definition there that comes from a, a USA toolkit that I would really recommend for those that might be interested. It has application across many spheres of influence in environmental science. Um, it's the systematic application of interactive, theory-based, and research-driven communications processes and strategies to address what's called these tipping points for change at the sort of individual community and societal levels. Um, there's a, a really excellent resource on what's called the C for Change project. Um, those of you that might be familiar with uh, UNICEF's work on communications for development, C4D, um, this, this all is related to this field of social and behavioral change communications. Um, certainly my own experience growing over the years from uh, work in, in health and development, then on sustainable lifestyles and, and kind of environmental protection through now to conservation, I've seen social and behavioral change communications applied very successfully um, in each of these fields. So um, my hope is that through some of the examples I'll share with you today, you'll be inspired to find out more about this great um, tactic, methodology, resource. Um, and uh, I'd be very happy to talk to people later that might be interested in applying it in their own work. Experience in other sectors, I've, I've mentioned this. I wanted to show this graphic in particular to flag a, a, a few resources that I thought you might be interested in. There is a publication you'll see on the bottom left, the social and behavioral aspects of climate change, snouting and, and very thought provoking about how it could be applied. Um, you know, we, we work with consumers, obviously, in the conservation example I'm going to go through, but uh, there's no reason why it can't also be applied, for example, to government officials or to policy makers. Um, the Behavioral Insights team, many of you might have heard of this group. Um, great set of resources, case studies, evidence um, about how you can really apply um, a process as such as CCC for um, kind of policy gain um, and, and thinking about the strategies that you apply with the populace in order to affect um, reasonable change for environmental systems. Um, the BCC in SBC um, is focused really on a, a very rich uh, theoretical foundation. Uh, this graphic here, I'm not going to go through all of these links, don't worry. Um, it's mainly to kind of emphasize the uh, diversity of, of theories, models, frameworks for change that are available. Um, my next set of slides, I'm going to go through what I would call some cornerstone reference points um, in this regard. 
Uh, you don't have to be, I would say, an environmental scientist in order to, um, uh, behavioral scientist rather, to um, kind of really understand how to apply these. I, I think my own experience, you can come up with some very practical um, and common sense approaches to interpreting these models. Um, we, we are in the process at the moment of designing a behavioral change decision tree, um, which will encourage people to answer, say, maybe 10 questions that um, then enables you to pick the theory or model that's most relevant to you. Uh, but there are also good resources online. This um, C for Change toolkit has more information about all of these models. Um, and uh, I hope that I can introduce uh, some to you today and inspire you to find out more. Um, the key thing about social and behavioral change is this work that it has in, in three domains, really, I would, I would say. So it's advocacy, social mobilization, and then behavior change communications. And this relates very much to something called the socio-ecological model. Um, really, in a nutshell, it, it recognizes that the various influences on a person's uh, either buying choice or how they use energy or, or how they kind of think about water consumption or production of waste, um, that decision-making process is, is influenced by internal factors. Um, so in the graphic on, on the bottom right of the screen at the moment, what's called personal or micro factors intrinsic to the individual, their level of knowledge, their attitudes towards something. It's also, though, influenced by um, kind of the social or meso factors. So it's, it's about how you interact with your peer group, your family, your friends. Um, I don't know if uh, many of you have heard of something called Dunbar's number. Um, Dunbar felt that there were 15 people that uh, were close to you that could really kind of influence your your thoughts and your daily processes and potentially even your habits. Uh, I don't know how I personally feel about that, but it's an interesting concept. It's kind of your very close social circle. I'm sure we all have this. Um, Around that, it, it's a bit more wide. It's kind of the the kind of uh, the community within which you live. So um, that could be sort of uh, London, and then the macro environment is the UK for those that are based in in uh, that European context. But um, this does also relate, obviously, in a country the size of China, where I I do work quite a lot now. And um, it's interesting to think about how you define across these various levels. But I think the key thing that I would take from this on a practical point is that um, there are influences uh, internally and also with your close friends, but also more broadly. It's about the, the societal and cultural context within which people are um, buying and using products uh, that we wish to influence one way or the other for social gain. So some of the cornerstone reference points um, beyond socio-ecological model, which is very tightly tied to this social and behavioral change communications process. Um, this particular one is cited a lot. Um, the theory of planned behavior uh, went through a process of evolution in the 80s and, and early 90s. Um, being totally transparent is not my favorite model. It has a great title. Um, I think it relates very closely to another theory called the theory of reasoned action and the theory of interpersonal behavior. This family of, of theories is... Um, something that, that's often a, a reference point for um, people coming into the sector and, and starting to think about how they might use behavioral science for environmental or, in my case, conservation benefits. I think one of the, the most common sense um, areas where there, there can be a disconnect, though, to, to most of us, we would realize that just because we intend to do something doesn't mean we always do it. So this, this link between intention and behavior I think um, for me, this is the model falls down slightly, but nevertheless, there is a lot of value in recognizing that um, the background factors in particular are important to think about when you're designing messaging to influence any choice. So if you want to um, run a campaign that's trying to promote a social or environmental good, um, it's worth thinking about the different influences on, on people's kind of behavior. So control beliefs very very much relates to how, how much they feel their behavior will influence the outcome. Um, normative beliefs is relating a little bit to this societal level influence. So thinking about, well, what's the cultural norm? Do I fit within that? Um, behavioral beliefs is very much about your attitude and inherently towards the behavior. So the, the idea of the theory of planned behavior is that you think about influencing each of these areas of belief 
in order to influence intention and then behavior. Um, but as I say, it's worth also recognizing there's a, a lot of subsequent research been done on, on what's called the attitude action gap or the value action gap. This, this kind of disconnect between what people care about and intend to do and then what they actually do as a result. I'm sure we all have personal examples. Another key reference point that I, I personally feel is something uh, perhaps that could be represented a bit more in a lot of environmental and conservation campaigns that I've seen. Uh, stages of change model is um, very straightforward, common sense. It's represented here by each of these steps. There's obviously a large body of literature about how you design messaging and approaches at each of these steps. Um, but the key thing to recognize is that behavior change is a journey and actually, in order to engage um, consumers in my case study um, in meaningful change, in lasting behavior change, you need to really target your campaign at each of these steps. So think about pre-contemplation, contemplation, when they're thinking about what they're going to do, preparation, at this point it's a good idea to give people a very tangible um, example of what they would do if they were going to make the change in behavior, action, um, in order to ensure that the action leads to maintenance, um, basically it's really important to recognize and reward and celebrate this, this behavior change once they've done it. And that will really help to make sure they don't go into to relapse, but they go into something called retention and refinement. So often some of the evidence will, will kind of um, recognize that relapse, retention and refinement may happen two or three times as a, a cycle before the behavior change becomes permanent. Um, but uh, I won't go into too much depth on each of these models, but um, certainly there's a, a lot of rich literature available to kind of guide people that are curious about how they might apply something like stages of change model at different phases in their, their campaign. Another one that I quite like is something called Lewin's change theory. Originally, this was called the um, unfreeze, uh, change, and then refreeze model, I think. Um, very, very early model, also one of the simplest that you might see in behavioral science. It just recognized the sense that, um, particularly in relation to habitual behaviors, which are almost subconscious in some ways, you don't realize you're making a, a, a cognitive choice to actually engage in that behavior. A good example of this that I've worked on before is uh, when you run the tap when you're brushing your teeth. Actually, you can waste a lot of water. We ran a lot of campaigns uh, many years ago to try to stop people from from engaging in this uh, water waste uh, behavior. Um, because it's very habitual, you don't really realize you're doing it. So the, the idea is that you, um, you, you provide a prompt that helps people to think about that, realize they're actually making a choice to turn the tap on, um, change it, just uh, encouraging them to see the benefits um, of what they would um, do if they were to engage this water-saving behavior, and then refreeze it. So again, recognize and reward that they've made the change um, in order to make the change permanent. So it's quite a simplistic model, but it's very important where you're looking at habitual behaviors, um, which often many environmental behaviors of this type, sort of household choices about energy consumption, water consumption, waste production, um, th these do uh, become quite habitual. And uh, another good thing to realize uh, at this particular juncture is that key life changes can be very powerful um, opportunities through which to um, deliver Lewin's change model. So if you're moving house or having a baby or getting married, this automatically disrupts um, and, and what you would call maybe unfreezes the habits. Um, so these become very important um, junctures at which to implement something like Lewin's change theory. So achieving reach, um, I'm sure we have uh, many examples between us of uh, how you see reports of how many people, how many millions of people have been reached by campaign, by communications. Um, a lot of the work in behavioral science research over the years has been focused on not just how you achieve that reach, but how you ensure that the reach is meaningful and gets to who it needs to. So the, the model on the top right of the screen there is Roger's diffusion of innovations. Um, this comes really from a commercial marketing background, but is very relevant to a lot of the initiatives that we would like to deliver between us as a community, I'm sure. Um, in particular, very attractive because um, you can really target your effort on the 2.5% of the target audience that are innovators. 
they're the people that will pick up the message first. And the idea is that they're very good at um, reaching the early adopters and thereafter it will go through this kind of process of uh, engaging other members of your target audience. So in order to reach the 2.5% of innovators, these are, um, I guess, in DEFRA terms, people you would call maybe positive greens. Um, they're people who perhaps would be open to this lifestyle change anyway. Um, and there are particular types of characteristics that Roger's defined as part of the model to show how you could really work with them, influence them, and, and engage their assistance in helping you to reach other parts of the community. Often it's quite interesting to think about laggards. What a lot of my work is uh, in relation to people who we would call die-hard consumers. They're, they're people that are not motivated necessarily by um, concerns about natural resources or animal welfare or even sometimes what the law is. Um, and these these are the reality sometimes of, of who we're trying to influence. Um, so it, in, in that instance, it's quite good to think about things like Gladwell's um, uh, personality types of connect Maven and salespeople. There's been some excellent research done on Mavens uh, some years ago now. Some some of you may already be familiar with the work of Brooke Lindhurst on this and the research they did for DEFRA. A great research study that provides some good insights into um, what what works and what doesn't. Mavens, who are seen as quite instrumental characters um, in order to connect people through sharing knowledge. Um, and the suggestion is that may, they might be the best people to reach innovators. So this, this model on the bottom right hand corner actually shows that there are different layers at which you could um, apply them in relation to Roger's diffusion of innovation. Time to go into it in depth today, so um, uh, I'm sorry about that, but I, I really would encourage you to have a, a look at some of the research base available in relation to this. It's a really critical way to help ensure you target your campaign and just don't um, go for big outreach, actually make the outreach meaningful. So achieving resonance, this is in particular something I'm really interested in. I, I describe impact with behavioral change communications as, as focused on achieving both reach and resonance. Um, behavioral insights team, some of you may have heard of them as the nudge unit, um, very influential group that came out of cabinet office work under Tony Blair's government. Um, they've advanced now and become an independent global consultancy, very high end, a lot of great research insights. Um, and they have big programs, mainly focused on public sector engagements, um, sometimes even focused on how to get us to pay our taxes better. Um, but um, they are uh, really great in terms of their experience and their, their insight into, for example, the types of messaging and approaches that might work um, in order to influence, uh, from our perspective, a social good. Um, so thinking the EAST framework is probably the easiest way to think about this. Um, and again, if you go onto their website, there's uh, some great examples of what e easy, attractive, social and timely communications, what these, these look like. Um, from my perspective, it's quite a nice common sense set of prompts to think about the EAST framework. Traffic actually ran a, what we call a change in demand webinar for our community of practice on the toolkit about three months ago now. It was delivered by the Behavioral Insights team representative um, in Asia, and uh, he talked about many of the things on the slide there in front of you. So it's it's great to be able to, to learn more about this. It can really help to ensure that um, once you've achieved the outreach in this meaningful way, try to ensure that the message you're delivering really has impact, um, and, and at least there's a way in which you might do that. Something that's popular in the UK, so I'm not sure about the audience uh, spread to where you are around the world, but I anticipated that uh, there might be many from the UK, so I, I included this um, Mindspace um, reference point. Uh, it's quite good, it's very popular with, with UK government policy makers. Some of you may have some experience of um, applying it. Um, I personally really like the framework for pro-environment behaviours. It's not too easy to find, but it is available on the DEFRA website still, so do dig it out and have a look. Um, it was my sort of first introduction to national scale um, campaign planning and how you could actually segment your population according to attitudinal um, signifiers. Often when we do consumer research or market research, um, the results you get back, uh, they, they focus in very much on socioeconomics or demographic signifiers. 
um, such as where people live, whether they're married, what their occupation is, um, their income level, etc. Actually, one of the most important things to bear in mind when you're designing social and behavioural change communications, behavioural science informed communications campaigns, um, is to think about attitudinal segmentation. That's really where you're going to be able to achieve great effect. And uh, DEFRA in 2008 produced this framework for high environment behaviours, which split the English population based on research into seven segments. It's a fantastic body of work and a great strategy, and I really do encourage anybody that's interested um, and doesn't know about it already to have a look. Um, if you have any trouble finding it, let me know and I will send you a copy. <clears throat> One thing I thought it would be worth including a little bit about is um, pester power. I, I'm sure most of you would think this is common sense and, and not really something behavioural science needs to have a theory about, but um, it's <clears throat> a term from marketing, <coughs> excuse me, a term from marketing from about uh, the, the 80s, 1980s, that um, kind of recognise the fact uh, kids were very good at influencing their parents to adopt a particular purchase choice. <clears throat> so in terms of when you get to um, a supermarket till and you've got sweeties there available, and kids of any age really pestering mum or dad to, to buy them something can be very effective. The breakdown on the um, left-hand side, the bottom of the screen there, looked at how it influences other purchase choices as well. And this data really varies across the world, but it is a worldwide phenomenon. There are some ethical considerations about whether you actually use pester power as a, a tactic in any um, campaign or approach. I think often the ethical considerations were more focused on when it's about commercial gain. There's a lot of criticism in sort of the late 80s, early 90s about use of this by commercial marketing companies as a tactic to influence choice in particular when it was for something that was like snack, snacks and treats in, in supermarket um, situations. But actually thinking about it from an environmental perspective, it's quite interesting to consider could we engage youth in helping to uh, um, kind of promote different style choices in their families and households. We've actually run um, big, big initiatives in collaboration with universities and colleges in China, for example, that's the photo on the top left. Um, which try to work with um, uh, these millennial populations um, to help co-create solutions and behavioural change approaches of their own that re reduce um, what we would call sort of negative purchase choices about illegal wildlife products and try to help promote sustainable alternatives instead. It's a very interesting approach. It has great promise, but it has to be used widely as well. <coughs> One of the tactics that, um, again, certainly if you're in the UK, you have access to some great resources there. Um, NSMC is the National Social Marketing Centre. Started out in the UK, but they do some amazing work internationally. And social marketing is a, is a tactic that I would really recommend uh, you have a look at for its simplicity and its applicability. Um, we use it a lot in our work to tackle illegal wildlife uh, product consumption. I'll explain to you in the case study that um, is shortly to follow how. Um, mainly, uh, this grid is quite a useful entry point. Uh, social marketing has um, eight benchmark criteria. That's the text in black that you can see here. But really, the common sense navigation into this is do you see things from your audience's perspective when you're designing your communications? Are you clear about what you would like people to do? Um, be specific about your behavioural goal, what you what you are encouraging them to think about. Uh, try to reference some of the theory. Maybe not uh, all of the hundred plus models that I showed you on the slide uh, a few slides back, um, but uh, certainly you know some of the cornerstone references um, that I gave in my earlier set of slides. That they're very common sense. Many of them very easy to apply. Lots of very practical evidence base uh, available for those that would be interested to to use them. Um, do the benefits of change outweigh the costs or barriers? So this is the sense that in order to encourage behaviour change, you need to pr present these benefits to the audience. And are you using a combination of activities to encourage the desired action? Some of you may be familiar with methods mix as an evaluation term, but actually in social marketing, um, it's number eight on the benchmark criteria. And it's just this recognition that it's not just about communications on else displays that uh, helps encourage change. It also requires sort of a, a mix of activities. 
I personally am a huge fan of face-to-face -face communication, things that engage people on a very personal level. Certainly, uh, I think that reflects my own experience that um, behavior change happens more um, actively than, than passively. So you would, um, you would see a, a display and kind of it would resonate with you maybe, but you need to actively engage in the topic and often that's through discussion with, with family or friends, etc. Um, this is an example, I won't go into it in too much detail, of, of how we've applied um, the methods mix through some of the work that we've done in China to reduce the consumption of illegally traded wildlife products, such as elephant ivory, rhino horn. Um, in this example, we wanted to reduce the use of these products for collection purposes. There's a, a community of interest in acquiring these rare and very expensive high value products. Um, for art or auction or collection purposes. Um, this was our green collection initiative, which we ran in collaboration with corporate leaders, civil society leaders in China, very much um, co-designed with them, led by them. We wanted to foster change from within to try to tackle this issue with their consumer group. Um, so support, giving people the means to change. Uh, the elephant that you can see there, we generated a a uh, campaign key visual that um, showed blue porcelain as an alternative to elephant ivory. Many of the product attributes that people seek to acquire are its rarity and, and high value, cultural links, all of these can be offered through blue porcelain, according to um, the experts that we spoke with. Um, and the slogan that we designed underneath the, the little graphic that you can see there in, in Chinese, it reads, uh, having cultural value without reputational or life cost. Um, and this for us uh, was something meaningful that we understood could be good in influencing change. So it's, it, it's trying to show how you can bring all together um, the elements that I've presented before in this uh, in this set of campaign key visuals that we delivered. Uh, in terms of design, change the physical context within which people make choices. Uh, the uh, kind of characters that you see there, one is our executive director, Mr. Stephen Broad. Um, he signed uh, MOUs with that's Tencent on the left and then Alibaba on the right. Um, these particular groups, hopefully many of you have heard of them, huge outreach in China in relation to um, uh, e-commerce and social media um, and uh, very influential partners uh, keen to champion the removal of illegal offers for sale on their websites. Um, for them, it's, it's about everyday good business practice, um, in addition to biodiversity benefit, and, and they were very keen to work with us to help remove these illegal offers for sale. Um, so alongside the campaign, that, that sort of change the physical context is, is very important. Inform and educate, we went along and delivered green, green collection initiative to uh, some of these expos. We, ha we have them in Europe as well. Um, where uh, people are, are showcasing opportunities for art auction and collection of many products. Uh, in China, as you might imagine, these events are enormous, uh, attract huge crowds, and uh, the gentleman that you can see there carving um, in the bottom left uh, is a master craftsman. He's trying to show that the value of the product is in the skill of the craftsmanship, not the material with which it's produced. Um, so this is a, a walnut in the middle, um, that he has spent several weeks carving, and it's uh, exquisitely fine in its detail, very beautiful, very skilled production, very high value product, which can also offer many of the, the attributes that consumers are trying to seek when they buy these, these ivory pieces. Control, compel, incentivize, disincentivize. This was uh, Wen Wan Tianzia, one of the market leaders for reaching out to the art auction and collection community in China, and uh, we wanted to recognize and reward their commitment to this cause. They were very influential in delivering talks and uh, activities and events with us through this green collection campaign. Um, and uh, the photos there represent our, our respect for um, their, their commitment. It's uh, uh, very encouraging to see this leadership from such groups in China. So that's social marketing. One example, there are, there are many in, in uh, conservation now, which is encouraging to see. That work was in China in relation to a variety of different uh, illegally traded wildlife products. To, to bring us over to um, a more recent example in Vietnam, focused on rhino horn. Um, the trade route between South Africa and, and Vietnam has been very well documented. Um, and uh, when we conducted research, we, we used this five-step process in order to 
identify the uh, behavior and audience target with um, social and behavioral change communications. Uh, step three is about behavior modeling. So thinking about this theoretical foundation, the approach you could take. Step four, marketing framework development. Sometimes that can be a social marketing framework. So you think about the eight benchmark criteria and design your communications um, against each of those criteria. And initiative implementation, also evaluation is important in that step. Um, but our research helped to identify that the rhino horn going into Vietnam was being consumed often for status purposes um, to, because it's such a high value product, you know, it's illicit, people actually use it because they want to um, be profligate with their wealth. Conspicuous consumption is a, a very well known term in, in economic circles. This was a very good example of that. Um, specifically because it was expensive, rare and precious, um, the target audience were, this was why they were buying it. So we, we developed a consumer archetype again, um, an approach very common in commercial, um, commercial marketing terms. Uh, any luxury products advertiser will develop a, a consumer archetype as um, an embodiment of all of the uh, uh, character attributes, motivations, internal attitudes, um, that they're trying to design a communications to appeal to an influence. Um, and so we, we have a lot of information about this consumer archetype, Mr. Rail, on our website. Um, sounds very random, but we have uh, research evidence on his age, the areas in which he lived, um, and uh, the type of pro profession that he, he had as well. Um, most importantly, though, as I mentioned before, we were really interested in his attitudes towards things because we felt that this was um, the most important insight that we could have in order to design an, uh, uh, an approach for impact. Um, so in particular, he was uh, keen to demonstrate success and the Chi initiative grew out of this opportunity to actually encourage him to see that his success could be demonstrated through his Chi, which is a concept uh, common to many cultures in Asia, um, showing that uh, Chi is about your internal strength of will. It's your kind of success comes from within, from your Chi rather than a piece of horn. Uh, and we designed a campaign, social and behavioral change communications, that actually used Qi as the main brand around which we wanted to engage this Mr. L consumer archetype um, and encourage him to, to move away from consumption of rhino horn. Just to move through the next set of slides quite quickly um, in light of the time, uh, we did track impact. Uh, although we tracked reach, we were particularly interested in and who the main communicators were and, and how they reach people. So for those of you that know about social network analysis, we looked at nodes, ties, and influence pathways. Um, although we achieved some very impressive outreach, what we were really interested in was how deep could we go into the, the very specific target audience, uh, which opportunities and avenues and partnerships offered us that, that depth and quality of, of outreach to the target audience. Um, we also tracked uh, resonance, I mentioned earlier, the way of characterizing impact as reach and resonance. Um, this particular graphic can show shifts in knowledge and attitudes. What we did was deliver a series of talks as part of our social marketing initiative, the Chi Initiative. Um, and you can see very clearly there through that graphic that the attitudes changed after um, each uh, talk. So um, it was conducted three times and the attitudes uh, towards possession of rhino horn, 80% of people thought it was okay to own rhino horn in the first um, uh, activity, but by the, the final activity that was down to 5% and protect the environment had gone up to 80%. It's quite an interesting way to see uh, this shift, but actually it's also incumbent upon us to recognize, you know, this doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to change their consumption habits. So we did uh, annual consumer research process, uh, very big, quite time consuming, sometimes quite expensive um, process to do, but also really critical in order to understand, are you achieving the impact in behavioral change terms, in terms of reducing demand for rhino horn that you really want? Um, and, and this particular set of, of graphics, again, I, I don't have time to go too much into detail with this, this research finding, um, but it was really critical in helping us to see that between 2014, when we started this work, and 2017, when we did this particular evaluation, um, there was a really encouraging shift in terms of 
um, a decrease in use for status, in particular associated in, in Hanoi, uh, where the uh, sort of political center of Vietnam is, but because um, in Ho Chi Minh, there'd been uh, sort of Ho Chi Minh is in the south. It's sort of more associated with a, a cultural centre. Um, there'd been increasing wealth, and uh, there'd been this sort of increase in use for sexual enhancement. It hadn't been something that had come out very strongly in in our baseline research, um, but uh, this particular process helped us to see that we were achieving impact with Chi in relation to undermining the status-driven use amongst Mr. L of Rhinohorn. But the in use for enhancing sexual performance in the West, it's a bit of a cliche. We think this is the um, only use for, for rhino horn. It's, it's not at all. It's uh, um, varied. There are different use types. But um, sexual enhancement had increased. So that's very important for us to be aware of because it kind of um, encouraged us to think about how we might design communications moving forward. Um, Next steps, therefore, trying to think about not only tackling the use of rhino horn for um, sexual enhancement as part of what we're calling Qi Phase 3, um, but also trying to think, because you're undermining this type of use um, for rhino horn, is there an opportunity to actually benefit other species while you're doing that? So other species um, used for um, status use in particular include um, elephants for their ivory. That's also in, in Vietnam to some extent. Um, pangolin meat sometimes can also be consumed for that. Um, we've explored that a lot more in the mapping motivations report available there. Um, if you would like to explore a little bit more around this case study and how we're actually doing the next steps, um, do have a look at it. I would really encourage you to read it. Um, thinking about all of this learning, just moving into the final couple of slides now. Um, very exciting to be able to offer this level of insight into success factors and lessons learned both in China, Vietnam for our, our own experience and, and also from others as well. So what we call this uh, community of practice. It's uh, actually a network of about 300 people um, united by their sort of stake, passion, interest or mandate in, in reducing demand using social and behavioral change approaches. Um, it's uh, based on learner networks that I um, used to convene in, in my previous life, uh, looking at how to use behavioral science to achieve um, sustainable lifestyles objectives. Um, and often they're very virtual communities, so that's why we describe it as convened through the Consumer Behavior Change Toolkit. Uh, but we do actually offer a series of, of events and activities as, as part of this work. Um, where we share our own insights and discuss how to bring behavioral science more thoroughly into um, conservation communications. Uh, at the moment, it's mainly focused on, on markets, how to reduce markets for illegal products. But clearly, there are huge amounts of opportunities as well to both take behavioral science further back along the trade route. Uh, so thinking about engaging communities and protecting wildlife in situ, reducing poaching rates, reducing trafficking sometimes reducing corruption that's involved around illegal wildlife trade, um, but also to promote sustainable consumption choices as well. Um, and we um, issue communications such as newsletters. We have a, a monthly webinar series, much like this one, um, but very focused on looking at the latest behavioral science techniques, research insights, findings, and having a discussion with experts from beyond our own field, um, more social science experts and those that have uh, experience influencing consumer groups into uh, what we might do in order to design really impactful communications and approaches. Um, there's some good links at the moment with policy frameworks. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with CITES. It's the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species. So you want to say well, that's an illegal uh, wildlife trade. That's the convention that, uh, that, that frames that three years, there's a, a conference of parties at this particular conference, uh, COP17 as it's called in Joburg in 2016. Um, uh, a demand reduction resolution was agreed, which is uh, uh, a very powerful opportunity for us to actually encourage governments to take responsibility to apply social and behavioral change communications in order to reduce demand for legally traded species. And it's the community of practice work that I mentioned to you, the support this gathering of evidence and insight and sharing best practice, what works and what doesn't, 
that's actually now informing next steps for delivery of this demand reduction resolution. There's some more information on this particular slide for those that are interested about it. Um, just to say other international policy links of note, it's great to see in the United Nations General Assembly Resolution 69314 is, is focused on tackling illegal trafficking and wildlife. This UN General Assembly Resolution actually also recognises um, the importance of strategies to influence consumer behaviour. So this is a really nice way to actually celebrate the opportunity to bring social science more into environmental and conservation science realm. Um, and with that, I'll stop because I'm sure all of our brains have too many tabs open. Uh, so thank you very much to IES for this opportunity to speak with you and I hope that's not been too rapid an overview. Questions are welcome. Thank you, Gail. That was really interesting. And yeah, I think you did well to um, uh, consolidate some of those really big projects that you've got going on at the moment. Um, one question that I kind of had that came through, you mentioned some of the work you're doing with universities, specifically in China. How effective has that been? And is it something that you're looking um, as an organisation to do a bit more in kind of primary and secondary schools? Um, it's it's interesting. I think there's there's different ways in which you might uh, um, engage universities in this work. I mean, we wanted to engage universities in in we ran competitions with I think there were about 800 of them. Um, this was 2013, 14 now, and um, we we wanted sort of creative ideas, innovative approaches from the students to reducing demand for illegal wildlife products and. We ran this competition amongst these 800 institutions and um, gave prizes uh, to develop a, a, a reasonable scale, not national scale in somewhere like China. We didn't have that much resource, but um, that, that was sort of the, the engagement process. It was, you know, how, how do, you, do you as a millennial feel it, it would be good to influence um, behavioral choice? And uh, um, it was a really exciting uh, process. It's a good way to engage um, some innovative thought around this and to actually promote pester power through um, co-design. Um, in terms of research processes, that is a possibility. Um, I think there's uh, huge opportunities. In particular, China has uh, an enormous academy of social sciences and very um, impenetrable body on many levels. It's is kind of so big is one of the, the challenges. It's, it's hard to know how best to get into that um, community. But there are lots of opportunities to do sort of the, the research side of university and college and school engagement through, through that body in particular. Um, schools themselves, there are others that, that already do this. So I'd, I'd strongly recommend those that are interested to have a look at uh, something called the Juche Initiative. They're doing a healthy eating program with schools across China at the moment. Um, some really exciting examples of behavioural uh, change being applied to to promote local and sustainable food sourcing, as well as sort of healthy lifestyle choices, um, and that's a national scale campaign. And um, Juche is uh, J U C C C E, I think. Um, I can certainly share the link for those that would be interested later. Um, and and that's sort of about education, but also provision of of kind of um, uh, of, of sustainable choices and uh, behavioural change messaging alongside it. Um, so that, that is an opportunity. For, for us, we haven't gone down that route. I think education programmes are very important. There are many groups that are doing that, in particular relation to conservation objectives. But uh, it, it does take a, a more long-term approach than, um, than you know, perhaps some of these initiatives would, would not be able to wait that long, I think. Um, so there's there's also that to think of, but they, they are very important, I agree. Sure, yeah, no, I can totally appreciate that. And um, we've had, had a question from Judy Hill, um, who asks, have you been able to actually assess the relative success of different communication techniques or, or interventions? And if so, which have been the best value interventions that you've found? I think that's a great question, Julie. Thank you. Um, I mean, there are uh, there's different uh, levels of evaluation. I think um, the answer to your question varies in different countries and cultures. Um, certainly, the work that's happening out here with demand reduction. So, um, the main focus for effort at the moment is is on high uh, kind of profile species such as elephants, but the ivory rhino for horn. Um, and tigers, uh, also pangolins increasingly. So it's 
sort of those four focal taxa are often featuring in many communications initiatives. Um, there, there are different approaches if we think about the three domains of SBCC of advocacy, social mobilization and behavioral change communications. There is a general recognition that actually in different cultures and countries you have to take a different emphasis with those three strategies. So for example in, in somewhere like China at the moment a lot of work is on the outer two um, kind of rings of, of the three. So uh, a lot of work on advocacy and social mobilization. Um, but in Vietnam, um, it's more focused on the inner wheel, so behavior change communications. Um, and that's just more about the strategy or tactic to engage of the three um, available in social and behavior change communications. Um, another way to, to kind of think about impact, I think, in, in countries such as Vietnam, there is a very strong track record of, of social marketing in particular as a tactic, um, and, and that lends itself to success. That's certainly one of the key kind of underpinning approaches that we've used with our Chi initiative, um, and, and that really seems to resonate. There's some, some very promising research evidence um, available on, on the impact of social marketing in particular. Um, I'm not sure if it's a direct answer to your question, but um, I've, I've done talks with uh, um, there's people like Dan Ariely, for example, in the Fuller Symposium at the end of last year, very prominent behavioral economist, uh, popular particular um, for his columns in things like uh, the Wall Street Journal, um, good friends with the recent Nobel Prize winner. His, his firm view was that if you do anything, just do piggybacking on other successful messaging. This is a really um, high impact way to achieve uh, communication. So, so for us with Chi, it was very much something we did to piggyback our conservation messaging on CSR messaging. We knew actually that um, Mr. L, our consumer architect for Rhino Horn in Vietnam, was, um, you know, he was driven very much by what would make his business look successful um, and very much less by a conservation message. Uh, so, for that and various other reasons, we, we sort of piggybacked our, our Chi message within this. Um, CSR messaging and, and that seems to be very impactful. So um, we could have a very rich discussion about that. We are actually about to hold a rec an expert roundtable with the community of practice in, in Bangkok um, in a couple of weeks time uh, where we'll be looking at different types of message framing which is another layer to your question. So um, I'm particularly interested in, in what guidance we can generate around when to use negative, positive or neutral messaging approaches. So, so do you promote a positive? Do you say this is what I want you to do instead? Do you just aim to negate the negative? Do you just say stop doing that? Um, or, or do you kind of say, okay, well, maybe you want to think about this alternative choice. Uh, there's some, some fascinating thought process and evidence base around that in behavioral science that uh, I'm really keen that we bring in. That's yeah, really interesting. And like you say, every every country is going to have a very very different approach based on based on the issue in hand and their their kind of um, standing. Um, we are running out of time, so I've got the one last question that I can ask you, and that's actually from Adam Donnan, our CEO. He says, in the UK and USA, increasingly debate often seems to be based on tribalism rather than an objective consideration of facts. Now, considering yourself right or left wing seems to come along with some prepackaged attitudinal beliefs to complex issues, e.g., the link between the right and wing and climate denial. Does behavioral science have any advice on how we can get society to um, not so much align every belief to whether you're conservative, liberal, progressive, Republican, or democratic, etc.? Um, I, I don't think there's any straight answer. That's an excellent question, Adam. Um, thank you for uh, giving me the most challenging question at the end. I uh, I, I just share some some experience from um, from China. It's not a campaign I'm involved with. It goes back to this Juche. Juche actually stands for the Joint U.S. Uh, China Climate Change Initiative, um, and. Uh, it, it's it's taking an approach that's not politicized at all. It's it's mainly about how you can uh, achieve what in Chinese terms they have a um, sort of political philosophy called ecological civilization. Uh, some of you may be very familiar with it. If you if you are, I'm sorry to explain it a little bit here. Um, but but it's about basically how uh, China can can prosper and grow. 
um, by building on the foundations of kind of ecological um, respect and resource uh, use in, a, in an efficient way. It's, it's fascinating. I, I hope that if you work internationally and in particular in Asia, you've heard of this um, because it's, it's a very strong core political value um, that resonates uh, across party lines, I would say, uh, not that that's obviously uh, an issue so much in China, but uh, it, it's great to, to come around this uh, vision of a prosperous future, which is not really necessarily about whether it's left or right wing, um, it, it's more about the opportunity of the future. It sounds a bit counterintuitive to present it in light of um, whether you're conservative, liberal, etc. I know, but um, that for me is a, a very powerful example of, of what uh, opportunities there are to to rethink this and reframe it. Um, and again, I would uh, come back to this this opportunity of piggybacking your messaging on another successful message. Um, so CSR is something that I've actually used in promoting sustainable lifestyles before. Theology is also uh, really good in terms of uh, many religions have a stewardship of creation kind of value to them. So it's uh, working with, with religious leaders. There's actually a group called ARC um, that operates internationally with religious leaders around the world to both generate joint statements of commitment to protect endangered species and to um, encourage their congregants, their, their kind of community to um, kind of protect and, and steward uh, animals, natural resources, the planet, um, they, they have some really interesting approaches that, again, don't really go down political lines. It, it's more about um, doing it because of, um, you know, opportunities to either demonstrate your, your religious commitment or, um, you know, adhere to um, core commercial values um, or, or to actually kind of think about your prosperous society in which you live, how you, how you celebrate the opportunity of a prosperous future. Um, and, and that for me is very much uh, love not loss. IUCN has a lot of information on um, how you just encourage people to move towards uh, love and, and not focus much on the loss. Um, and, and this is uh, also another way to to, um, to think about reframing messaging. I'm not, there's a lot that we could talk about in that, that area. I think it's probably a longer discussion. Yeah, definitely. Um, sounds really interesting. It almost warrants a whole nother whole another webinar to explore it further. Um, I'm going to wrap it up there because we've um, hit our hour and I haven't got any more questions waiting to be answered immediately now. Um, as Gail said, a lot of sources were embedded within that webinar, so please do contact her um, if you want further access to those or if you're struggling to find them, her details are on the screen now. And just a massive thank you to you, Gail, for um, doing that and for doing it remotely as well. It's really, really interesting. So yeah, thank you all for logging in today and thank you to Gail for finding the time and joining us. No, it's great. Thanks so much and uh, do drop me a line if anybody would like to discuss anything further. Thank you.